Hello, welcome to 2024 and part two of the Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton story. I feel like story isn't a great word to describe it, but case seems weird to say also. Situation? Situation sound okay? The, the Monica and Bill situation? Sounds like you're gossiping at work. The Monica and Bill situation? I hope you had a great new year. I hope you had a good string of holidays if you celebrate those holidays if you didn't i hope you found something to do (laughs) because there's nothing worse than like holidays you don't care about because like nothing is open like i hate thanksgiving i hate it so much it's my least favorite holiday is no secret i'll scream from the rooftops i'll do a dissertation on my hate for thanksgiving but like there's nothing to do (laughs) everything is fucking closed So I hope you didn't run into that problem. I hope you were having a great time doing whatever you were doing. If you didn't listen to part one, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I feel like you should go back and like do that first if you're just jumping in right here in the middle because there is going to be a part three. So this is just, this is not the place to start, honestly. You should start elsewhere. Or like I said, I'm not telling you what to do though. Do whatever you want. I don't care. You can hear Harvey jingling around out there. We have to put a bell on her because she was so small when we got her that we were scared we were going to lose her. Like, you ever see those people that let their turtles walk around their house, but they tie a balloon to their back? That's, like, what we needed to do with Harvey because she was so tiny. And now it's just very fun to hear when you get home. You can hear her coming with her little jingly bell. Come here, Herbie. Harvey's nickname is Herbs and Cheese. Harvey Doodle Dandy. She has a lot of nicknames. I forgot I'm not editing this, so I probably... Well, for my subscribers i'm not editing this so i should probably not take this long of pauses but harvey is making little tiny biscuits on my lap and i hope she lays down and hangs out with me while i finish part two so we left off with monica was sort of forced to leave the white house and start working at the pentagon which she really didn't want to do it wasn't a good fit for her if you watch impeachment you can sort of see like it's just like a very old type of it's not exciting not an exciting job So she moves to the Pentagon, and she meets Linda Tripp, who is, I guess we're just going to get right into it. We're just getting right into it. So she becomes close friends with Linda Tripp, who is 24 years older than her. And Linda had worked for two decades as a secretary for the military before landing a job working in the George H.W. Bush White House in 1990. When Clinton beat Bush, Linda stayed on to work for the White House Counsel Bernard Nussbaum and Deputy Counsel Vince Foster. Two years into Clinton's first term, she was transferred to the Pentagon. Pentagon. (laughs) She was transferred to the Pentagon Public Affairs Office. And I think that is around the same time that Monica was moved. So they're sort of are ending up at the same place at the same time. So Monica thinks they're friends. So she's confiding all about this man she's seeing that's starting to blow her off. So she's telling Linda all about this man who's like starting to ignore her. Monica says they did not have any more physical encounters for all of 1996. They did talk on the phone and have phone sex on several occasions, but with her out of the White House, there just really wasn't an opportunity for them to be together, which is exactly what everyone who moved her wanted. Like, everything is working perfectly. His communication was getting shorter and more infrequent. Monica said she was getting very frustrated. Monica repeatedly told the president she hated her Pentagon job, and she wanted to return to the White House. In a recorded conversation, Monica recounted, a month had passed, and so he had called one night, and I said, well, I'm really unhappy, you know, and the president said, I don't want to talk about your job tonight. I'll call you this week, and then we'll talk about it. I want to talk about other things, which meant phone sex. One friend understood that Monica complained to the president about not having seen each other privately for months, and he replied, every day can't be sunshine. In an email to another friend in early 1997, Monica wrote, I just don't understand what went wrong, what happened, how could he do this to me? Why did he keep up contact with me for so long and now nothing, now when we could be together? So it's after the election had happened. She was like, this is what he was saying we were waiting for, and now he's still not talking to me. One morning in September of 1996, so backing up a little, Linda Tripp testified that Monica asked her to sit down for coffee before work, As they approached the cafeteria, Monica looked like she was ready to pop. In Linda's account, Monica blurted out that she had been having an affair with the president. It was ongoing, but there were problems because of the presidential campaign. So, remember, Monica thinks Linda is her 
like friend. She thinks they're friends. Well, Linda hears this and she starts talking to a literary agent because Linda is thinking she can make a book out of this. Like she can write a book about the president having an affair with like an intern, but she's not an intern anymore. The literary ag- agent also does Monica's situation no favors and ham- really hammers the nail in her coffin when she suggests to Linda to record all of her conversations with Monica. So after she writes the book, Monica can't come back and say that she was lying. She's like, you need to cover your bases in case you ever need to just record these conversations so that she can't say that you're a liar or try and sue you or anything like that. Monica has no idea that her and Linda's conversations were being recorded. When talking to the literary agent, Linda said, I wanted to chat with you about something that is completely ridiculous. The literary agent said, yeah, but you realize the press will destroy her. And Linda said, you really think they could destroy her? And the agent, her name is Goldberg, said, well, no, but the public might destroy her. She said, I mean, I love this idea. I would run with it in a second. But do you want to be the instrument of this kid, really? She said, if you're ready to go ahead with this, you have to be ready to lose her as a friend. And Linda said, oh, I have already made that decision. So Linda doesn't care about her friendship, if it was even real, at all. Monica said after learning her affair was with the president, Linda encouraged her to go to the White House and continue the affair. She said she told Monica it would be a fun story to tell her grandkids. She's like, you should just keep doing it. Like, wouldn't it be so crazy to tell your grandkids one day that you had an affair with the president? Monica's like, I don't know. I'm like 20 fucking four years old. So in 1997, after the election is over, Bill and Monica resume their relationship. Bill's secretary, Betty Curry, sort of was the lady in the middle here at this point. She would patch through Monica's calls to Bill. After phone calls, Betty would sometimes then take Monica's line to arrange an appointment with the president. Betty said sometimes her only task of the day was paging in Monica. Like she would have to go to work on a Saturday just to let Monica in to see the president. Secret Service officers and agents took note of Betty's role. Officer Stephen Pape once observed Betty come to the White House for the duration of Monica's visit and then leave. When calling to alert the officer at the West Wing lobby that Monica was en route, Betty would sometimes say, you know who it is. On one occasion, Betty instructed Officer Brent Chinnery to hold Monica at the lobby for a few minutes because she needed to move the president to the study where they would meet. Monica did ask Bill why he couldn't just let her in, and he said like, it was because of like the logs of everything that they get sent through. People would start to ask why she was visiting him. Whereas if she goes through Betty, it sort of looks like there's a third person there and like everything could be construed for business reasons. Betty would also intercept gifts from Monica to Bill. She said she usually opened the president's mail to check through it first, but she did not open his mail from Monica because she said it appeared like it would be personal. So it's clear Betty knew what was going on. She said she suspected an inappropriate relationship just based on everything she was doing for them. Betty also testified that she tried to avoid learning details of their relationship between the president and Monica. On one occasion, Monica said of herself and the president, as long as no one saw us and no one did, then nothing could happen. Betty responded, I don't want to hear it. Don't say any more. I don't want to hear any more of it. She, like, really wanted to stay as far out as she could, despite how involved she was. Betty did help keep the relationship a secret. When the president wanted to talk with Monica, Betty would dial the call herself rather than go through White House operators who keep logs of presidential calls made through the switchboard. When Monica called and Betty put the president on the line, she did not log the call, though the standard procedure was to know all calls, personal and professional. She would try and sneak Monica in entrances far less monitored, just like trying to get the least amount of eyes on her as possible. Just like all of that. So Bill's secretary is now in on this, and really, her job is to work for the president, so it's not her job to say it's wrong or make his life harder. She had a good gig, and I bet she, like, wanted to keep it, so she's not going to, like, say any shit. The Secret Service would also say they were pretty privy to the situation. They said Monica's visits were like clockwork. She would go in, the president would take her to a different room, and then she would leave. On February 14th, 1997, the Washington Post published a Valentine's Day love note that Monica had placed. The ad said, Handsome, with love's light wings did I or perch these walls, for stony limits cannot hold love out, and what love can do that dares love attempt. Romeo and Juliet, Happy Valentine's Day, M., So it's not like she posted this, but like her full name on it was like a, I want to say Craigslist situation, like a missed connections. It's like a secret note in the paper. Harvey wants to snuggle real bad, but also it makes it impossible to hold my iPad when she wants to cuddle like this. Okay. 
but I have to hold my iPad because we're getting to the most famous part. Their most famous sexual encounter was on February 28th, 1997, which is their first sexual encounter in around 11 months. According to the Star Report, Monica attended the radio address at the president's invitation, wearing a navy blue dress from The Gap. President Clinton told her to see Betty after they took an official photo because he wanted to give her something. Monica said, so I waited a little while for him, and then Betty and the president and I went into the back office. Once they had passed from the Oval Office towards the private study, Betty said, I'll be right back, and walked onto the back pantry or the dining room. Monica said, so I waited a little while for him, and then Betty and the president and I went into the back office. Once they had passed from the Oval Office toward the private study, Betty said, I'll be right back, and walked onto the back pantry or dining room, where, according to Betty, she waited for 15 to 20 minutes while the president and Monica were in the study. Betty, who said she acted on her own initiative, so like they didn't ask or make her leave, testified that she accompanied the president and Miss Lewinsky out of the Oval Office because, quote, I didn't want any perceptions of him being alone with someone, even though he, like, very much was. In the study, according to Monica, the president started to say something to me, and I was pestering him to kiss me because it had been a long time since we had been alone. The president told her to wait a moment as he had a present for her. As belated Christmas gifts, he gave her a hat pin and a special edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. Monica described the Whitman book as the most sentimental gift he had ever given me. It's beautiful. It meant a lot to me. During this visit, according to Monica, the president said he had seen her Valentine's Day message in the Washington Boast, Boast, Post, and he talked about his fondness for Romeo and Juliet. Monica later testified that after the president gave her the gifts, they had a sexual encounter. She said, we went back over by the bathroom in the hallway and we kissed. We were kissing and he unbuttoned my dress and fondled my breasts with my bra on and then took them out of my bra and was kissing them and touching them with his hands and with his mouth. She said, and then I think I was touching him in his genital area through his pants and I think I unbuttoned his shirt and was kissing his chest and then I wanted to perform oral sex on him and so I did. And then I think he heard something and heard someone in the office so he moved into the bathroom as I continued to perform oral sex, he then pushed me away, kind of as he always did before he finished, and then stood up and said, I care about you so much. And I continued to perform oral sex, and then he pushed me away, kind of as he always did before he finished, and then I stood up and I said, I care about you so much. I don't understand why you won't let me. It's important to me. I mean, it just doesn't feel complete. It doesn't seem right. So I don't know if I mentioned this yet. I may have briefly mentioned it, but up to this point, nobody is finishing their sexual encounters for lack of better words. There's, like, no finishing going on. Because remember, he told Monica, like, he wanted to trust her before, like, they did things like that. Monica testified that she and the president hugged, and he said he didn't want to get addicted to me, and he didn't want me to get addicted to him. They looked at each other for a moment, then saying that, I don't want to disappoint you. The president consented. For the first time, she performed oral sex through completion. Thus, the infamous blue dress was created. Later, on a taped phone call, Linda Tripp urged Monica to not wash the dress and to stash it away. To Tripp, the blue dress served as Monica's insurance policy, as she said, like, how the phone calls were to her. She's like, you need to keep that dress just in case he tries to come out with some bullshit. On one of the taped phone calls, Linda said, I want you to think about this and really think about it instead of always dismissing what I say, okay? Monica said, I don't always diss what you say. Linda said, well, but you're very stubborn. You're very stubborn. The navy blue dress. Now, all I would say to you is the future is a blank slate. I don't know what will happen. I would rather you have that in your possession if you need it years from now. That's all I'm going to say. Put it in a baggie. Put it in a Ziploc bag. Pop it in with your treasures for what I care. I mean, whatever. Put them on your little antiques. Monica said, for what, though? And Linda said, I don't know, Monica. It's just this nagging, awful feeling I have in the back of my head. It could be your only insurance policy down the road, or it could never be needed and you can throw it away. But I, I never, ever want to read about you going off the deep end because someone comes out and calls you a stalker or something and you have, and he confirms it. God forbid, something awful like that. So she's saying, this might come out and people might call you crazy. Like, you sort of need this. So you can say, am I crazy or am I telling the truth? On March 29th, 1997, they had their last sexual encounter. According to Monica, Betty arranged the meeting after the president said by telephone that he had something important to tell her. At the White House, Betty took her to the study to await the president. According to Monica, their sexual encounter began with a sudden kiss. She said this was just another one of those occasions when I was babbling on about something and he just kissed me to kind of shut me up, I think. The president unbuttoned her blouse and touched her breast without removing her bra. 
He went to go put his hands down my pants and then I unzipped them because it was easier and I didn't have any underwear on, so he manually stimulated me. According to Monica, I wanted him to touch my genitals with his genitals and he did so lightly and without penetration. Then Monica performed oral sex on him again to completion. According to Monica, she and the president had a lengthy conversation that day. He told her that he suspected that a foreign embassy was tapping his telephones and he proposed cover stories. If anyone ever asked about their phone sex, she should say that they knew their phone calls were being monitored all along and the phone sex was like just a put on, like they were just pretending because they knew people were listening, which like doesn't make, that just sounds like a lie a child would make. That does not make any sense. Over the months that followed, Monica repeatedly asked the president to get her a White House job. In her recollection, the president replied that various staff members were working on it, including Mr. Nash and Marsha Scott, Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Director for Presidential Personnel. According to Monica, the president told her, Bob Nash is handling it, Marsh is going to handle it, and we just sort of need to be careful, you know, and then he would always sort of validate what she was feeling by telling her something that she doesn't necessarily know is true, like, I'll talk to her, I'll see, just things like that, like, I'll do it, and then he didn't do it at all. Monica came to wonder if she was being strung along. In April or May of 1997, the president asked if Monica had told her mom about their relationship, and Monica said no, but she had already told her mother. He asked because word had gotten back to him that, like, Monica's mom told someone who told someone who retold the president that this was going around about him. So on May 24th, 1997, the president ended their intimate relationship. According to Monica, the president explained that they had to end their intimate relationship Earlier in his marriage, he told her he had hundreds of affairs, but since turning 40, he had made a concerted effort to be faithful. How lovely of him. It's like, I made it to 40, I should probably stop cheating on my wife. That's what normal people do. He said he was attracted to Monica, he considered her a great person, and hoped they would remain friends. He pointed out that he could do a great deal for her. The situation he stressed was not Monica's fault. Monica did not take it well. She was sobbing, begging for it not to be over. Although she and the president kissed and hugged thereafter, according to Monica, their sexual relationship was over. So three days after this meeting, on May 27, 1997, the Supreme Court unanimously rejected President Clinton's claim that the Constitution immunized him from civil lawsuits. The court ordered the sexual harassment case Jones v. Clinton to proceed. So remember, at the way beginning, Paula Jones was trying to sue Bill Clinton for sexual harassment. Well, the whole time, um, Bill Clinton was operating under the assumption that he was actually immune because he was president. But the crime took place when he was a governor, so that immunity he's talking about doesn't apply here. So Monica spent a lot of time trying to reach him, to rekindle their relationship, and also to get a job, because he did promise to bring her back to the White House after he won the re-election and get her out of the Pentagon, because she did not like the Pentagon. It would appear he made no effort to do so. Monica was extremely unhappy. She wrote him mean letters. Monica met with Bill Clinton again on July 4th, 1997, after sending him a letter on July 3rd. That is where, more or less, she threatened to reveal their intimate relationship. She wrote she wanted to remind the president that she had left the White House like a good girl in April of 96, whereas other people might have threatened disclosure in order to retain the job. She wrote that she would even be open to taking a job in New York, the United Nations, anything. She, like, just wants to get out of the Pentagon. So after that letter, Betty called Monica and told her to come in the next day on July 4th at 9 a.m. In Monica's recollection, their meeting began contentiously with the president scolding her that it is illegal to threaten the president of the United States. He then told her that he had not read her July 3rd letter beyond the Dear Sir line. He surmised that it was threatening because Betty looked upset when she brought it to him. Monica suspected that he actually had read the entire thing. He was just lying. Monica complained about his failure to get her a White House job after her long wait. Although the president claimed he wanted to be her friend, she said he was not acting like it. Monica began weeping, and the president hugged her. While they hugged, she spotted a gardener outside the study window, and they moved into the hallway by the bathroom. She said it was there that the president was the most affectionate with her that he had ever been. She testified that he stroked her arm, toyed with her hair, kissed her on the neck, and praised her intellect and beauty. He remarked that he wished he had more time for me, and so I said, well, maybe you will have more time in three years. And she was thinking, like, when he wasn't president, like, he was going to have more time on his hands. And he said, well, I don't know, I might be alone in three years. And then Monica said something about them being together, and he sort of, like, jokingly was like, oh, we'd be a good team or something like that. And he jokingly said, well, what are we going to do when I'm 75 and I have to pee 25 times a day? And she's like, we'll deal with it. So they're, like, joking about being together for, like, a very long time. 
Monica testified that I left that day sort of emotionally stunned for I just knew that he was in love with me. So before she leaves that day, she then was like, oh, one, there's like one more thing I think you should know about. She informed him that Newsweek was working on an article about Kathleen Wiley, a former White House volunteer who claimed that the president had sexually harassed her during a private meeting in the Oval Office on November 23, 1993. Monica knew about this article from Linda, who had worked at the White House at the time of this alleged incident and had heard about the incident from Mrs. Wiley. Michael Isakoff of Newsweek had talked with Linda about the episode in March of 1997 and again shortly before July 4th, and Linda had subsequently told Monica about it. Monica told the president what she had learned from Linda, whom she did not name at the time, including the fact that Linda had tried to get in touch with Deputy White House Counsel Bruce Lindsay, who had not returned her calls. Monica testified about why she conveyed this information to the president. She said, I was concerned that the president had no idea that this was going on and that this woman was going to be another Paula Jones, and he really didn't need that. The president responded that the harassment allegations were ludicrous because he would never approach a small-breasted woman like Miss Wiley. He then said that during the previous week, Miss Wiley had called Nancy Heinrich to warn that a reporter was working on a story about her and the president, and Miss Wiley was wondering how she could get out of it. So she's like, I don't want this to come out any more than you do, so I'm just letting you know, and maybe you can, like, squash it. A few weeks later, the president called Monica in for a meeting to ask if Linda Tripp was the person she was referencing when they talked on July 4th. She said yes, and then asked if Monica had mentioned the fact that Wiley had called about the reporter doing the story, and Monica had to say yes, because Wiley had notified them that a reporter knew about that phone call. So she was calling the president, and she was saying, like, someone knows I called here trying to to, like, get this story squashed. He asked her point blank if she trusted Linda, and Monica said yes. He asked if she told Linda about their relationship, and she said no, and then asked her if she would consider trying to get Linda to talk to Bruce Lindsay, the White House counsel, again. The next day, according to Monica, she did talk with Linda, and then she called Betty and said she needed to talk to the president. He called her that evening. She told him that I had tried to talk to Linda and that she didn't seem very receptive to try and get in touch with Bruce Lindsay again, but that she would continue to try She said the president was in a terrible mood after that, and their conversation was brief. A few more times, they met to discuss jobs, and Monica would try and rekindle their romance. Newsweek published the Kathleen Wiley story in its August 11, 1997 edition. The article quoted Linda as saying that Miss Wiley, after leaving the Oval Office on the day of the president's alleged advances, looked disheveled, flustered, happy, and joyful. The article also quoted Robert Bennett as saying that Miss Tripp was not to be believed. After the article appeared, Linda wrote a letter to Newsweek saying that she had been misquoted, but the magazine did not publish it. It was on October 3rd, 1997, that Linda recorded the first in a series of many phone calls with Monica, in which they discussed everything from their workout and dieting schedules to the details of Monica's intimate relationship with Bill Clinton. Although she was urged by that literary agent to tape the phone calls, Linda said she was swayed to start doing it because Robert Bennett said she was not to be believed in that article. She said, okay, well, I will show you, motherfucker. Linda recorded over 20 hours of phone calls with Monica. A lot of it was Monica complaining about the lack of relationship with Bill and how it was starting to fizzle and he was ignoring her. And Linda always knew what to say. People who listen to the tapes say it's obvious. And Linda always knew what to say. People who listened to these tapes say it's obvious she was, like, doing whatever she could to get information out of Monica. Like, if things were going well, she would encourage Monica. If things were going bad, she would placate Monica and talk about what a terrible person he is. She's just, like, matching Monica's energy to get her to keep going. And just because there were, like, only 20 hours of taped conversations doesn't really mean that was it. They had worked together for almost a year, so Monica really thought of Linda as a friend, even if Linda was scheming the whole time. So Monica had been confiding in Linda for quite some time. So I want to just read like a couple of the transcripts. I wanted to do this in chronological order with the timeline, but it it does get a little confusing with all the official reports and research and stuff. So I did like the dress thing. That was a taped conversation much later after she started recording. But these ones, I just like, I just want to show that they were sort of like, not friends, but these were like normal conversations between like, Monica obviously thinks Linda is her friend. So they're just like chit chatting. But Linda is doing this in a way to get the maximum amount of information out of Monica that she can. So Monica said, listen, you'll get mad at me. You know what I said at the end? And Linda said, what? And Monica said, the worst I could say. We were getting off and I'm like, all right, I love you, butthead. And Tripp said, no. And Monica said, I called him butthead. And Linda said, you didn't. And Monica said, I did. 
And then he said, and then what did he say? And Monica said, said that was it. He just sort of kind of hung up or I hung up. And I was like, oh my God, what the hell just came out of my mouth? And Linda said, butthead. And Monica said, butthead. This is like a normal conversation between two friends about how like she called her boyfriend a butthead. In calls with Linda, Monica recounted the disappointment that came with her April of 1996 reassignment as well as the president's promise that came with it. Linda said, you mean he's the, he's the one who told you that you had to leave? And Monica said, no. He said, why do they have to take you away from me? I trust you so much. He said, I promise you, you know, something like that. If I win in November, I'll have you back like that. He said, I could do anything I wanted. You could be anything you want. And then I made a joke and said, well, can I be the assistant to the president for blowjobs? And Linda said, you did not say that. And Monica said, I did. And Linda said, oh, Monica, Monica, Monica. Then on October 6th, 1997, Linda told Monica about a rumor she had heard. Her friend Kate told Linda, who told Monica, that people were saying Monica was never going to work at the White House ever again, and her advice to Monica was to get out of town. So, to Monica, this is it. She had been contemplating moving anyway, and she now knew that nobody was really trying to get her a job at the White House. She had, like, just had it. So she sent a letter to Bill asking him to admit that he helped fuck her life up. And not, like, she's not asking him to do this publicly. She's like, you need to just admit to me that you helped create this entire shitstorm that my life entered into and to get her a job that she doesn't have to work for at the UN by December. She's like, I just want to start. I don't want to interview. I don't want to go through all these hoops. I want you to get me a job at the UN by December. No bullshit. At approximately 8.30 a.m. on Saturday, October 11th, according to Monica, Betty called and told her that the president wanted to see her. She told the president that she wanted to pursue jobs in the private sector, and he asked and he told her to prepare a list of New York companies that interested her. Monica asked the president whether Vernon Jordan, a well-known Washington attorney who she mu- knew was a close friend of the president's and had many business contacts, might help her find a job. According to Monica, the president was receptive of that idea. They then spent the next few months going over Monica's wish list for a job where she then states that she does not want to work at the UN anymore. She wants to go into the private sector. She's just like just sort of over the government and like business like not businesses but workplaces like that at this point. She also specifically wanted Vernon Jordan to help because he wasn't really a part of the government, so it could be like a separate thing. Her concern was if people found out they were helping her get a job, they could they could say, Well, they just gave her a job to shut her up. Like they handed her another government job just to shut her up. She didn't want that. She like wants it, this to be completely separate. While Vernon was out of town, Monica received a job offer from the UN that she wasn't really expecting nobody had warned her that that was going to happen and she didn't really want it so after a month of getting the job offer she declined it in early january of 1998 but it would turn out that monica would have a lot more to worry about on friday december 5th 1997 attorneys for paula jones identified monica as a potential witness in her sexual harassment case Paula's lawyers decided to show the court a pattern of behavior by Clinton that involved his allegedly repeatedly becoming sexually involved with state or government employees. So they specifically named Monica Lewinsky because they had heard her name floating around. They only named her to try and legitimize their case. They had no idea what they were really getting themselves into. And that is the end of part two. Part three is going to pick up with all of the shitstorm that follows Monica being, what do they call that? Called for a witness, but like, whatever. All of that. That was much shorter than I thought. I'm sorry. I thought this was going to be way fucking longer. This is like no joke, like 40 pages long. But part three does have like some really long conversations in it that take up a lot of space, but maybe don't take up a lot of time to say out loud. So I don't know how long it will be. And I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you're enjoying these multiple parters I do enjoy getting into the nitty-gritty of these cases I have a very hard time leaving information out I had made a joke um when me and Taryn were doing this I was gonna do the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr which I did do by the way if you wanted to go listen to it but I had like told myself as I'm doing it I'm like I'm not gonna include a bunch of like I just want to focus on the assassination like the actual crime that was committed And then I spent like four hours researching the Montgomery bus boy got. And I was like, well, how can you just leave stuff out? You can't leave stuff out. So I hope you enjoy these. If you don't, if you think there's just like a lot of unnecessary information, because I could have left a lot of the stuff out and you would have gotten the same 
point, but I just think it's so interesting getting into like the details of like what had actually happened. If you're not into that, that's totally fine. I don't have to do it. Uh, I don't know. I will still probably do it. So just don't tell me if you don't like it because it'll just hurt my feelings. <laughs> I will see you next week for part three, rolling right into the new year, hopefully back on track. I am getting tonsil surgery in a couple weeks, so you won't be hearing from me live on air for a couple weeks. They will all be pre-recorded, not old episodes, but I'm going to do a batch of episodes here soon to have on deck. That way, I don't know how long I'm not going to be able to talk for and things like that. If you successfully got your tonsils out or operated on as an adult and it was totally fine, let me know. But I want to remind you all that I have multiple anxieties. I have medical anxiety. So if you did it and it was terrible, don't tell me. Please don't be that person that's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. It was so terrible. Because I will literally throw up. I'll throw up. I'm not about that life. Like, I'm not going to die, right? No, I don't think so. Allegedly, I'm going to be fine. That's what everyone keeps saying. But I don't think I have anything else to talk about. Because I've just been sitting here recording the past... (laughs) the um to sum it up and then all these episodes right in a row so i'm just gonna keep going on through because harvey's very sleepy she's sleeping on my lap she likes to be covered up because she's a weirdo so she's covered up with her blanket i don't know if you could hear that but that's my stomach (laughs) okay great i have to go things are getting out of hand in the studio over here i hope you enjoyed it Let me know what you think about this case. Let me know if you, like, knew anything about this because I did not know all of these details. And if you haven't watched the um, American Crime Story about this, it's very good. And I'll see you next week for the conclusion of everything that had happened after the fallout of this Paula Jones case. And I'll see you next week. Saying goodbye is so awkward when I have no outro music yet or intro music, so I, like, never know. (laughs) Like, all right, goodbye. I can never know. So sorry if it sounds awkward, but it feels just as awkward as it sounds. If it is any consolation. Don't forget, I am on Instagram, Mad Times with Madison. I think, like, just the full government name of the podcast is my Instagram handle where I do post a few pictures Nothing like we used to of, like, key moments from the case. So there will be some photos if you wanted to see what was going on. Check that out. And I'm for real going to go now, I think. I think I have to go. I think I finally have to say goodbye. All right. See you next week. Or if you are on the Patreon or an Apple subscriber, you can don't forget you can get part three right now. You've had it the whole time if you so choose to listen to it. Okay. Bye.